Ultimately, the move by Ramsey MHK Laurie Hooper, which aimed for net carbon neutrality by 2035, failed to carry under the combined vote, with 10 votes for and 23 against. Douglas North MHK Ralph Peake's amendment was unanimously approved, 33 votes to zero. Well, uh, Mr Hooper joins me in the studio. Um, good afternoon, first of all. Good afternoon. Um, just a quick reflection on the debate this week, first of all. Several members of Tinwald, uh, Miss Betterson, Mr Crookall and Mr Peake, for example, um, said the main difference between those two amendments we saw was over the issue of a target date by which the island would aim to become uh, net carbon neutral. Um, are, are you are you disappointed that a, a date wasn't agreed at this stage? Yeah, I, I think I am really. Um, other jurisdictions are managing to, to to declare themselves. Actually, this is when we aim to be here by. Uh, it's quite disappointing that as an island we can't do the same thing. Um, really, the 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 reason that seemed to come forward for not putting a date was they didn't they, there wasn't enough evidence. They don't have enough information to be able to make a decision on whether that date was uh, achievable at the end of the day. And and I think that just shows that there was a fundamental lack of understanding amongst a number of members uh, and, and the ministers specifically, uh, because we have a, most of this information already. When they put together the last climate change strategy back in 2016, uh, which again Mr. Peake was was driving, uh, they actually had independent reports done. They're all available uh, on the government website. They had a lot of work went into that strategy and I think the evidence hasn't changed, the information hasn't changed. What's changed in the last few years is our realisation of just how urgent and how important this has become. So to, to have to wait another kind of nine months now to get uh, some more independent evidence and more reports seems a little bit unnecessary when we, we really could have made that bold statement and said actually you know what we know this is the right thing to do, we know this is the right thing for the Isle of Man so let's, let's go ahead and do it. Uh, and the reason that 2035 that I picked that date, uh, partly it's because uh, during the the last round of, of evidence gathering uh, that was the date that was recommended by some of the independent experts back in 2016 uh, but also it's the date that ties in with uh, when our power plant could potentially be decommissioned so turning off the largest single polluter uh, the largest single emitter rather on the island uh, actually it all ties in quite nicely with that's probably the earliest we could do it and so from my perspective I was kind of trying to set out that ambition and saying well 2035 is probably the earliest we, we could do this so let's let's aim for that and then if we end up missing it, we end up slipping. We do have time then to build in kind of a contingency plan up to the, the backstop date, I think it was described as, of 2050. Whereas if we're, we're not targeting, I'm not saying we're not going to get there till 2050. If we're, we start slowing down, if we start missing targets, if other things happen, which will do, it's, it's 20 years away, 30 years away for 2050. Of course things are going to happen between now and then that are going to shift our priorities. Um, we might miss that date entirely. And then where does that leave us? Uh, you know, even, even though we are only a small emitter, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, it leaves us on in this uncomfortable place where the international community has moved on a set dates and the Isle of Man is, is lagging behind and I don't think that's somewhere that I, I want the island to be. Um, some, some members voiced concerns that the 2035 date was just arbitrary, I think was the word that was used. Um, I mean, you've sort yeah. of gone some way to answering this already. Wh why was that selected? Like I say, in, in part, uh, I, I was quite disappointed actually that it was described as arbitrary. It, it did really show that the, the lack of understanding that was there actually by those members that were making those claims. And it was quite disappointing that the Environment Minister seemed to be one of them. Uh, 2035 was chosen for, for, those, for two main reasons. The first being, uh, if you look back at some of the, the work that was done uh, back in 2016, that was a date that came out and saying, actually, it's not just a date that we should be aiming for. That's really the date that we should be doing, irrespective of whether it's achievable or not. That's when it has to happen by. Uh, and the second reason is because it was tied in very heavily to the potential decommissioning of the power plant. So we all know that the power plant's been heavily bond funded through debt. Uh, the repayments sort of w we now in the middle of the 2030s, the uh, life cycle of the power plant, same middle of the 2030s. So the MUA are going to have to be looking at potentially replacing that power plant with something else, uh, ideally uh, something renewable. Uh, by 2034, 2035, 2036 anyway. So it fits in quite nicely with, with what their potential plans might be. Uh, and I think one of the, the risks now that we haven't agreed that date, it gives the MUA a bit more flexibility to say, well, let's let's keep it living another five years maybe, let's keep it going another five or six years after that date, which, uh, it, again, it may be in their thinking, may not, I don't know. Uh, but from my perspective, it really is important to say, to put a marker down, put a stake in the sand and say that's what we're aiming for. 2035, absolutely achievable. We've we've already seen the figures, we've seen the evidence, we've seen DEFA's own projections as to where we might be at that date. So we know it can be done. I think it just comes down to do we have the political will and the leadership to make it happen? Um, 
you've mentioned a bit sort of earlier on about some comparisons with other jurisdictions. Um, what, just for a bit of background, what are the targets that um, that, that have been set elsewhere and, and, and how do they sort of compare to, to what we have on the Isle of Man? Uh, some of them are, are, like the UK, have set themselves the 2050 target, which is what we have, uh, which is obviously quite slow. We've got countries like Finland that have declared 2035 already, um, but the closest comparator for us as one of our main competitive jurisdictions would be Jersey. And Jersey have already declared a 2030 date for their um, their carbon neutrality target. Now, Jersey have obviously got a bit of an easier uh, way of having it than we do. They've, their circumstances mean that they'll be able to, to do things we can't do to hit that date. Um, but when you're looking in in this international uh, perspective saying actually where are the opportunities for us as an island? How can we leverage some of the, the uh, transition to a zero carbon economy to create jobs and bring people to the island man? We're going to be competing with jurisdictions like Jersey and if they've already gone ahead uh, and announced actually we're going for this full steam, 2030 is their date, uh, for us to turn around and say we're fine, we're going to take a slow track on that, really I don't think sends out the right message at all. I'm trying to think back to the first sitting. Um, I think it was Mr. Shimmins who was talking about the comparisons with Jersey yeah. and, the, and the competition with, with um, a very much a comparable populace, if you like. Mr. Shimmins then um, went on to, I think, vote against your amendment. Yeah. Um, 10 voted for, 23 against. Um, were there any surprises in there for you in terms of how, how people's allegiances went? Uh, no, actually, um, I think... Going back a month, uh, if people had just stuck with it, uh, we would have been absolutely fine. I think the introduction of this kind of middle ground um, get-out clause for the Council of Ministers, which is essentially what the amendment was, uh, to give them a bit more breathing space, to get a bit more uh, time for the pressure to ease off on them, which is what I think will happen now over the next six to eight months, is they'll be able to, to step back from this. Uh, that gave uh, that release valve, and a lot of members, I think, felt, oh, rather than pushing too much, we'll, we'll go for this kind of middle ground option, which, like I say, was quite disappointing, but not a surprise, I think. I think the one thing that I would take away that was positive, though, is I don't think anyone in Timwell Court was in disagreement and uh, we all agreed something needed to happen and this needed to be done it needed to be done uh, urgently it is important and uh, it was just I think people were finding different ways of putting that pressure on government I, I think it was it was Alf Cannon that turned around and said congratulations to the people that had pushed and cajoled government I think it was his words now from my perspective you shouldn't have to cajole government into doing what's right they should be doing it anyway um, but the fact that uh, these two amendments were tabled really was just two slightly different approaches as to how you control government into doing what everyone thought really was the right thing to do.